Hello everyone, so I'm Georg and I'm a free software guy. Um, and in my journey in the professional world of free software, because that's all we do, um, I have come across a story that I found rather intriguing, and when I tried to discuss it with my colleagues and friends in the free software community, they all went, what is that? I've never heard of this. Like, huh? Um, and since that's consistently the reaction I've been getting for the past half year or so, um, I figured it's perhaps worth to actually give a talk about it and give you an idea of why I think the power story is actually one that should interest us very much. So first briefly, what do we do? So Colab Systems, um, headquartered in Switzerland, although we have an office here in Berlin as well. Um, we are a col collaboration software provider. We're an ISV and we provide the software. It's 100% free software. It's 100% open standards. Um, so we do like email, you know, tasks, note calendar, contacts, files, everything shared, of course, in installations up to hundreds of thousands of users. And one of the largest clients of ours is the Sears Holding Corporation, the guys with the big Sears Tower previously, although they had to sell it because it got too small for them. Um, so we do collaboration software. Um, as a group, we are strongly uh, free software minded. In fact, um, all of us, if you ask us, will typically consider things such as open core or, you know, like shared source or whatever, abominations. We're all from the free software community, long-term free software community members. Our CTO should be rather well known to a lot of people here, given that it's Aaron Seigo, who's been president of KDE for a couple of years as well, right? So we are from the free software community, all of us. So we're a software company, right? Software is what we do. Why would we care about hardware? Because open power is actually hardware, right? Like, why do we get involved in that? Why would we even bother to get involved in this? Wow, that's really well readable. Anyway, um, so why do we care? Um, one reason is Colab Now. Colab Now is a software as a service. You can call it a cloud platform. Um, it's run on, it's obviously running Colab, right? Um, it's 100% free software, like the entire stack. Everything we run in our own data centers is always free software. We never use a proprietary offering for anything, really. Um, it's 100% free software. It's developed by the provider, us, right? And it's our own operations, so no one outside the company has hands on anything, and it's our own hardware. We own the hardware, actually. Um, we've bought it, and it's expensive, let me tell you, but we've bought it. Um, the reason we did that is very simple. We figured anyone with access to the hardware obviously is in a unique position to compromise whatever comes on top, right? Um, if you have access to the hypervisor, of course you can get access to anything that is running on the hypervisor. So the only way that we can actually say this is best practice, secure to the best level we can make it, is by doing it from the bottom up, which is why we're saying we need to have the hardware, the operations need to be ours, hosted in a data center that is, you know, nicely caged and secure, in a cage that only we have access to, and so on and so forth. We're actually the only one that I know in this space that fulfill all these requirements. Uh, most others fulfill one or maximum two of these. Now, running our own hardware, buying our own hardware, is of course something where we start to think about what hardware do we run, right? That's one of the ways in which we got involved in the question, so what are we running? Like, you know, the hardware level, if compromised, is a problem because it compromises everything above. So how can we assure that it's actually trustworthy, that what we run is secure? For us, that's a problem. And it's one that's been discussed for like laptops and other um, devices a lot in the community. Server side, we generally tend to say there is no alternative. So what should I do anyway and buy Intel, all right? Um, the other thing is, of course, we also provide Colab to customers, right? Um, 
clients who run this on-premise, like the city of Munich, for instance. Um, anyone who wants can run Colab in their own installations. Um, very often, um, these are also application service providers or companies that feel that they want some level of control over the data. Again, they will ask us how to run this best, right? For them, security, integrity, and control are important matters. So the question is, how do we do that? And, well, yes, I mean, then we say, yeah, I mean, we can give you this part of the stack, right? But, I mean, we cannot guarantee anything underneath because, well, you know, the hardware part we have no control over. Because, I mean, obviously with Intel, there's always the big fat elephant in the room. Um, Intel processors are remarkably complex, they're remarkably closed. We know they have opcodes in there that are specifically put in there for Google, for Facebook, right? No one else knows them, no one else has access to them. We don't really know what's happening in them. We know they have a management engine in there that can do all sorts of things including talk over the network, you know, bypassing your operating system, bypassing your firewall. Um, so you, do, you don't see this anywhere, right? There's no chance of controlling this on the machine. You need to have other machines that then control whatever comes from that machine, trying to mitigate this. But your problem is, even while you can do everything to try to mitigate that, you don't want your own hardware to work against you, right? I mean, you, you don't want to go to that trouble you would ideally have hardware that actually does what you want it to do, where you can ensure it's actually secure, and figure out what it is doing, and make it part of your defense, not something as a threat vector to, to defend against. So that's where we've been coming from, right? Like, we have a problem here. I mean, we don't like this. We've not seen anyone with a really good answer. Most people tend to just ignore the problem which, you know, if you don't know any solutions, is perhaps a rational choice. It is, however, not a good one for us. Oh, great. Um, so why is there no alternative? Um, I'll have to read this off for you because there's no way you can read these. Um, cost is one of them, right? Um, if you wanted to build something that would be competitive to a modern architecture, Intel server, right? I mean, if you build something that's data center level hardware, um, the investment that you would have for that is enormous. You would need gigantic amounts of competency. You need the means of production, right? The question is, um, how good is it? What's your efficiency? The energy efficiency is really important. I mean, it's been going up and up and up for, for every new generation of hardware. I mean, in Switzerland, the energy is so expensive that very often people swap out their hardware every four to five years because the, the purchase of the new hardware is financed by the electricity saving alone. I mean, it's really expensive. Um, so, um, get it, it, I mean, yes, you know, we can build hardware, yes, but can we get that level of efficiency? That's really hard to do. I mean, there, there is decades, literally decades of innovation in this, where quite a few very smart people have been working on that problem. So, in other words, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, right? It's, you have a very, very, very long way to go. Um, going from zero to where they are now, even as amazing as this community is, I think would be a real problem for us. You know, I, I don't think any of us has the level of resource, competency, and dedication to make that happen. It would probably take nation states competently by, um, bonding together to do this. However, um, nation states and competent in IT and together um, isn't the most common thing to happen, right? So, hardware has history. I mean, we have the Intel history, right? Long, long history. I mean, I myself started out as an assembler developer, actually, um, on the Amstrad CPC 464. Um, yes, exactly. He had it too. Uh, it was actually a wonderful machine at the time. It was really great. Um, and then I switched to the Atari ST with a 68K processor, right? Um, and this was like a huge leap. I mean, ridiculous difference. And imagine my disappointment 
when I switched to the PC later, because that was obviously the coming platform, and I looked at the assembler codes, and they looked oddly familiar from back in the Z80 days. I mean, same principle, same registers, same instructions, right? You go like, wait a minute, that's just Z80 on steroids. Um, and effectively, that's what Intel is until today, because they cannot get out of that legacy. They cannot change the way they work. Um, of course, that's also your arm, you know, your, generally your risk area of, of computing. Um, that has developed too. It has also had evolution in multiple ways and forms and shapes, right? The power PC, I mean, this is the 92. I mean, IBM's been at that for a long, long time, right? Um, IBM's been developing the power PC for a very long time. It's been continuing to evolve it and actually Technically, the power PCs have always been very good. However, of course, IBM, especially in the 90s, has also not really been the greatest company to work with, right? Um, so the power PC had its shortcomings in the sense of who to work with. Intel just beat them on, on, on market penetration, hands down. And still, these other platforms continue to evolve. And in fact, I mean, today we have Power 8, Power 9 is now in the making. When you look technically at what these processors do, right, they are incredibly, forgive me the pun, powerful. Um, power is really good at heavy I.O., heavy compute, heavy parallel. Um, it is much better than Intel on those. I mean, the bang for buck you get on those is much, much better, actually. And all of these are fantastic for like data centers, cloud, right? I mean, that's exactly the kind of properties you would want to run many things in parallel efficiently on little hardware. So it's actually really good for that. ARM, on the other hand, I mean, is obviously everywhere, right? I mean, we all carry ARM devices with us all the time. Um, I mean, the ARM generation is amazingly good at the, you know, low power, get the most efficiency out of this because our, my battery is running out scenario. There's very little, you know, that does that better. Intel, technically, maybe this slide should be swapped, is in the middle between them. It tries to do everything, right? The entire spectrum. But it's actually not at good, as good as either of the other two, at e either the, the data center thing or the low power thing. So actually, if we lived in a world where we only had power and arm, that would be completely fine. We'd be missing nothing. So Intel would not be missed. That's the bad news for Intel, but Intel's, of course, still everywhere. Now, IBM has done a move that I found very interesting when I realized what they had done, because I hadn't heard about this until about a year later. Um, about two, three years ago now, they actually said, we're going to put our entire knowledge, all the patents, all the specs, everything about the power architecture and the power chips into the Open Power Foundation. And it's going to be a member open association. Anyone can join. In fact, I mean, you could sign up today, right? Membership is free for individuals and for academia. So you don't even pay anything. And you get access to everything. I mean, you can build your own chips. In fact, Intel, uh, Intel, in fact, China, why do I confuse that? Anyway, <laughs> but, um, but, um, well, there's a certain similarity, but China has chosen to do that. Um, China will build its own power chips. They will disable parts of the crypto on the power CPU because they don't understand them well enough to trust them, but they can do that. And they can add their own hardware modules to the motherboard later, right? They can build their own boards and everything, so they don't need it on the, on the CPU. They can add it in other places, so they disable that part because they have the specification, they can do it. They build their own CPUs now. Rackspace and Google have announced the new data center node for them, right? They've designed a data center node based on Power9, because they want to put that into their data centers. They are members of the Open Power Foundation as well. There's a lot of motion in this going on. We have now more than like 250, I think, are members in the Open Power Foundation. And people who are starting to look at building workstations on power for security purposes, very obviously, saying, I want an actual workstation where I control it, right? Because I have 
the, I know what the CPU does. I, I will even have a market for CPUs where I have more than one factory, more than one provider building them. I have the firmware, I have the software on top. Suddenly I can actually control this thing from the bottom up. And that, for me, was rather interesting. I mean, once I realized what was going on there, I figured this is interesting enough for us, at least as, as Colab, to get involved because, well, for us that means finally we can actually offer a full stack that's much more trustworthy than anything based on Intel, right? So we did this Colab Taster event series in June together with Red Hat and IBM where we showed people, look guys, it's actually you can have a full stack open now, everything. And I know that everyone, including our governments, is completely welcome to engage with the Open Power Foundation. So if, say, hypothetically, Europe said, we actually want control over our IT, right? We, we want to control the stuff that runs our data centers, that runs our governments. Well, they could. There could be a European power chip built to the same specifications, to the same quality, and at the same technical level of what is running Google tomorrow and Rackspace tomorrow and Facebook tomorrow. We'd be eye to eye, technically, but under our control. Which I think is why we as a community should be interested. There's a story in this that adds a layer below what we're already doing that is fascinating. Now, the Open Power Foundation is, of course, I mean, there's many members, right? It's like any associations with many different interests. Um, IBM has, of course, you know, started this whole thing, but they're deliberately now um, giving up control. But still, I mean, of course, you know, but, but it's IBM, right? I mean, um, so here's why I think they're genuine about this. They have burnt the bridges. Um, when... IBM sold the laptops to Lenovo, right? People were like, wow, that's a weird move, right? People were like, bold move, interesting. Um, not so long ago, they also sold their server generation to Lenovo. I mean, IBM had built a very, very modern architecture for, you know, your um, big data center um, solutions. Um, the entire Flex system series that they've built it's fairly new hardware. It's actually better, technically better, than what Dell or HP have to offer. It's a really fascinating, extremely performant, you know, modern hardware. It will make money for a long time to come. They sold it to Lenovo. They sold it to Lenovo to burn the bridge and to get rid of the dependency on Intel. Intel has no way anymore to hurt IBM because they're no longer business-wise dependent on them. They've sold their dependency off. And that, to me, when a company like IBM does that, means that they're serious about moving in a certain direction. And then the level of engagement they show with the power story and the power foundation, the amount of activity they show toward that, the way in which they genuinely are willing to give up control, the Chinese fab for, for the power chips, um, IBM is supporting them. It's actually encouraging them to do that, but it's not controlling them. IBM understands, and I believe genuinely, that they, the world is changing. And in fact, to me, they understood that a long time ago. I mean, I've, I remember long time ago, 12, 13, 14 years, when I was sitting with, I think it was Bob Suter at the time, um, from IBM at a dinner table, and he told me, look, you know, we understand. I mean, openness will move up and down the stack. It'll be everywhere. Proprietary will only exist in certain niches in the future at some point. I mean, there's a transition period, yes, and everything, but openness will win. We understand that. So we need to restructure ourselves to actually live with that, to, as a company, add value to this. And to me, the Open Power Foundation is, is simply their way of trying to move that into the hardware world, to adapting in a way that they say, we have our competency, we add our competency to this, and you know, yes, we, have, we create chips and we want to sell chips, of course, but we want to provide an actual value here, and we're willing 
to actually commit to this, which they did by A, putting it into the foundation, so they've given it up, right? They've given it to the foundation, which is now means we can control it. If we go into the foundation and get active there, we can shape this. We can build the next generation with them. And they've burned the Intel bridge. Those two, to me, are strong signs why I believe they're genuine. So what I think as a community, as people from the free software community, what we should do is we should grab this. I mean, we should engage right away with this. We should get involved. Um, we should, you know, go make sure we go into the Open Power Foundation. In fact, I, I spoke with Daniel Pocock earlier. I said, I think Debian should totally join the Open Power Foundation as an academic member, you know. Let's go in there. Sure. Excuse me. What is the point about joining the foundation to begin with? If, if the member doesn't have to pay, what's the, the purpose of joining the foundation? Well, first of all, um, you, you get a seat at the table. Secondly, you are, I mean, Canonical, for instance, is in there already, right? Um, so you, you get access to the parties that are working on the hardware. You get also access to, I mean, they have access programs for better hardware for development purposes, stuff like that, right? So you get cheap access to the hardware if you need it. Um, and you get to engage with the actual members um, at the table because there's going to be very soon the Open Power Summit in Europe. Um, and you are then there to actually start talking to them because, frankly, my experience working with IBM is... They are willing, but they don't understand us very well. Um, their understanding of how free software works, of how the, all this open innovation thing works, of the community, um, the culture of that, getting that into their company is a struggle for them. It's a real uphill struggle for them. I mean, it's to the point that I suggested to some of them, actually, we should do a, like a mentoring program, right? Where, where we from, free, from the free software community adopt someone from IBM and teach them how it's done, um, essentially. Um, because getting that culture transfer is something that we can help them with. And then we can shape the way that they think about certain problems, and we can help them evolve along the route that leads to the to where we want to get with this as well. So yes, I think we should actually, and some of us are interested in hardware, right? We should pay more attention to this. We should get engaged. We should support it. I think we should actually get involved. And that is perfectly on time and pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georg. Now we have a roughly five minutes questions and answers. Okay, over there. So what if? So what about building these things? I mean, um, obviously, building the full chips would require a complete foundry, which none of us have, and which I think. So, is there anything that you could, for instance, uh, use to burn those into FPGAs or any any alternative implementation? over um, going to a foundry and have these things turned into silicon? Wow, that's a question that I cannot answer. Um, I'll have to come back to you on that one. But please be in touch with me because I want to get you that answer. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, regarding the desktop um, open power thing, um, I just want to say that there is an uh, U.S. Um, company, Raptor Engineering, who is um, going to have a crowdfunding for a workstation based on open power. Do you it's know a, when it's coming? Um, in a month. They announced it yesterday that they um, ah, excellent. get interest now for crowd supply. So it's a Talos um, platform workstation. So, um, yeah. So it would be really good if this succeeds because afterwards, although the beginning is very expensive, afterwards it looks like it will be more affordable. So if you can spread the word, that would be awesome. Thank you very much for that. So everyone, please, in a month from now, we're going to put out word as well. Um, spread the word and support that um, because that's exactly the one I was also thinking of. It's Talos um, with a Raptor 
Um, exactly. So um, they w are trying to build a power-based workstation, um, which I think would be an in incredibly important project to succeed, because I would like to see more of those, to be honest. So let's help them along if we can. I actually hope they're going to be in Barcelona, because I wanted to talk to them. Uh, three questions. First, how do you verify that the hardware you have is exactly that what you wanted from your provider? Is there any way? Well, I mean, that's always the big problem, right? Um, I mean, it's that that's always the 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 the, the million dollar question at the end of the day. Um, of course, you can test the chips to some extent, right? Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, look, look at, I mean, you can't even test fucking cars for their, for their emissions, apparently. Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, these things are much more complex, right? So you can hide a lot in there in theory. In practice, um, the question is whether or not um, they would get away with that um, and how long. Um, if you don't trust that one party, the idea is that you can then buy from another. Um, if we succeed in building up a network of actual, um, you know, uh, places to buy CPUs from, as in producers of CPUs, um, to those specifications, right? At that point in time, because the specifications we can check, right? It's, it's just about making sure that that's actually ending up in silicon. Um, but then if we have an actual market there, then not only will the fact that you can lose market share make the vendors a little bit more honest, um, you can, you also get to choose where to buy it from. With Intel, that hope is not there, right? I mean, no one will ever buy them, uh, will ever build them. Okay, so. second question in combination with FPGAs, uh, are there already uh, someone thought about, so I had to have already someone thought about, um, metric devices bullying them? Like, um, if you have your level three switch and you want to trust it. So, um, because power is extremely good for I.O. and, um, and um, the whole, you know, communication side, I mean, actually, in the power CPU, you can even assign, like, a core to the, to the I.O. Um, so, it, if you have an I.O. heavy application, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, your, your hardware even isolates failing of the hardware underneath from your hypervisor level. So the virtual machine no longer sees this as it does on Intel, right? So it's, it's a lot more robust in that sense. And I'm pretty sure you can also look at this from a build your own switches and, you know, your own data center equipment from this. I don't know who has done that so far. And is there any comment or uh, yeah. sentence from uh, projects like Coreboot or RISC-V? What, what do they say about this? That, that's a very good question. The, the, what I find is that most people haven't even considered this or thought about this or looked at power in any way, shape, or form in the past. You seem to know more than me, so. Yeah, so regarding Core Boot, um, as everyone knows, since um, Intel um, and the management engine or with the um, platform security processor of AMD, it's not possible anymore to build a system or to buy an x86 system where all the firmware is free. So in this regard, um, the Core Boot project um, is very, uh, looks very forward to open power. Um, there, although IBM has, as far as I know, a free implementation of a bootloader, um, there's also interest to port Core Boot um, over onto um, um, the power um, devices. And um, yeah, then th there's the next thing regarding free platforms. The other alternative is ARM devices. In a certain part, there's some little blob. But um, yeah, there's also a good uh, talk from Timothy Pearson um, on the Talos website where he t um, shows all the uh, where where he talks about the things. What is ARM good for? As um, Greg told us, it's for low power and battery device, but it won't. Um, be a replacement for current desktop boards anytime soon because it's not as powerful. Yeah, Wonderful. so Corboot is very well aware of it and um, hopes that open power succeeds. Because Thank you very much. It still won't change, unfortunately. Sorry. Yeah. So, so I mean, frankly speaking, I think a world 
um, with power on the on the server side and you know the powerful desktops and ARM for everything that needs to be energy efficient and lightweight and carried with us wouldn't be such a bad place to be in. Um, I think it's far preferable to one where Intel is everywhere. To be honest. You mentioned that you uh, that uh, Open Power is not only targeted at um, at server systems but also at desktops. How is the graphics stack there? Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, you look look up the specifications, perhaps of the of the workstation that um, Raptor Engineering is trying to build, um, because that's the first and only, to, at least to my knowledge. Maybe you know more, but um, that's the only one right now that's really realistically looking at creating that kind of workstation. And I, I saw on the website that they have some level of the, of a preliminary stack, how they think it's, it's going to look like. I don't know whether it's going to change, but that might answer your question. Thank you very much. Also to the people asking questions, thanks again, Georg. Thank you. <laughs>